And, you know, as a solar guy, I think that might give us all enough time to transition uh, to a subsidy free business model to make sure that these tax credits and subsidies are not abused. Can you expand a little bit more on that? What would you like to see in the final version of this bill and that ultimately <laughs> a lot of this money ends up flowing to Chinese manufacturers? What, what would you say to that? Uh, and, and also, uh, you know, I think there's some great opportunities in the coming three years in terms of deregulation and sales tax fairness. And in reality, the, the majority of these subsidies and benefits end up going to these large corporations. Um, what, what happens if we don't take this proposal, James? The smarter way to go solar. All right, we're back with James Showalter, CEO of EG4 Electronics. Uh, you who've been following the channel for a while, you know that we've had James on a number of times this year. Now, James, I understand that you're in Washington, D.C., as we're recording today, uh, working on lobbying to help preserve solar subsidies and solar tax credits. Now, I saw solar stocks took a beating yesterday when it looked like the original Senate version of this budget bill uh, was going to sunset the, t the the solar tax credits, similar to the House version. But I understand that there have been some major developments just in the last 24 hours. If you would, please bring bring the viewers up to speed. What is the current status of this big, beautiful bill and how it would pertain to solar subsidies and tax credits? Yeah, Joe, um, I, absolutely, uh, you know, pivotal week for the solar industry right now, especially your residential installs and your long tail commercial guys. Uh, what we just saw this morning was, uh, and this is really fresh, uh, was uh, the uh, the Republican team on the cut the IRA fiscal hawk side uh, make a direct offer to residential and uh, small commercial installers and uh, ask for their support in a universal cut all subsidies by December 31st of 2028. Um, this is uh, this is something that is uh, much much better than a shock cut at uh, December 31st of 2025. Um, and, uh, there's an incredible opportunity that they are being very public about. Um, uh, and, you know, as a solar guy, I think that might give us all enough time to transition, uh, to a subsidy free business model. Uh, so I'm, I'm incredibly excited about this. I think talking to our installers and knowing their business models really well, I think this might work for everybody. That's good to hear. Really encouraging to hear, James, because last time you and I spoke, it sounded like we, we had basically six months and then it was all, all going away. I mean, of course, the last couple of years, you know, if you're talking about a residential solar installer, the last couple of years have been a doozy anyway, just with higher interest rates, higher dealer fees, and the loss of one-for-one -one net metering in many markets. If you couple on top of that, a complete, you know, wipeout of the 30% tax credit really makes it tough for installers out there that are trying to keep their doors, uh, doors open. Yeah, it's just too much too fast. I mean, I, I believe that this is actually still in an innovative position where the cost of everything we do can come down over the next three years. But you're right, it's a shock. My younger brother, Adam, runs uh, Signatech Solar uh, out just out of Sulphur Springs uh, and, and two crews. And, you know, we talk about this and just, just how much time it would take to, to really, really continue to attack those soft costs. Uh, and, and also, uh, you know, th I think there's some great opportunities in the coming three years in terms of deregulation and sales tax fairness. But this gives us time to execute on those and also really dive into the nuts and bolts of everybody's business model and deliver a better cost solar. Great, great. Well, I know the industry is going through a number of changes as well, and we, we certainly need some reforms in certain areas, but it sounds like this is a step forward. So, uh, and James, I know because also, you know, you at EG4 Electronics have also made investment in manufacturing or U.S. assembly of some of these solar products. Um, how does the bill in its latest form or the latest proposal affect solar equipment manufacturers, especially as it relates to domestic content? Yeah, no, I think I think this is one thing I've looked at with, you know, our company's lawyers on the IRA since before in, in the previous administration. And uh, the, the, the manufacturing was uh, subsidized temporarily through what was called a 45 X credit. And uh, this is something that uh, the, the new proposal is addressing, which is um, the 45 X was a 10 year subsidy. Uh, locked in at 2022 rates. So basically, whatever you could build an inverter for in 2022, they'll pay you a subsidy in 2029 or 2028 for that, which is even this year, uh, which already, you know, these are items whose costs have been dropping 10, 15, 20 percent a year compound. So it was, uh, you, you know, the, 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 the initiative to, to fund U.S. manufacturing is good and we've invested I think I think I'm probably one of the first solar manufacturers just come out there and confess that uh, it's frankly oversubsidized and it can be addressed. 
Um, it's not something that we should we should get away from manufacturing entirely. But I think we're overpaying manufacturers like me right now. And, and that's really unfortunate when we're seeing residential installers looking at their business models, their businesses at risk in six months. And what the current Senate bill was, was 10 years of continuing the 2022 rates. Um, I think a compromise proposal that re- puts those rates on a competitive reduction every year, uh, like they should have been, in my opinion, for any good manufacturing policy, uh, helps provide some of the money to uh, put 25D back in play. And it's been a part of the negotiation. That's great. So, so where do things stand now as far as as uh, as far as the the key points of the latest proposal? Do we have a, a specific step down schedule for what would happen between now and the end of twenty twenty eight, or is all that still being still being uh, formulated? You know, you know, it's being formulated. Um, what is proposed publicly, and I think, look here, this is this is I think the most interesting turn of events that we've seen, which is uh, the Republican team reaching out directly. Uh, and openly with a pretty open proposal on X to uh, to uh, the, the, the solar installers and, and solar CEOs. They want they want to see uh, see people in the industry come to the table on their side and 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 frankly help achieve a end the IRA in Trump's term uh, position, which is their interests. I mean, you can't blame them for being who they said they were in, in the election. Uh, but I think that they're, they're willing to work with the industry and do it in a way that preserves jobs and gives people enough time to uh, get all of these jobs into a place where uh, you're going to be stupid not to buy them, even without subsidies. That's great. That's great. Now, James, I know one of the things that you spoke about on our last episode was the issue of needing to have some sort of price caps or price controls to make sure that these tax credits and subsidies are not abused. Can you expand a little bit more on that? What would you like to see in the final version of this bill as it pertains to uh, solar solar price caps or price price guidelines. You know, I don't want to I don't want to dive into specific policies on that because I really you know I'm just somebody who is aware of what's going on on this and is just just sharing this with you. Um, but Joe, what I will say is that if there's not a mechanism to push install companies to drive their cost efficiency to where they will make sense without the tax credit, then you know we got we got we got to cover a thirty percent gap between what we're selling for today and what we would be selling for on January 1st of 2029. So if there's not a mechanism that creates incentive and pressure to do that, um, then what we're doing is just kicking a crisis down the road. So I think that um, that, that something like that uh, may have to be in it for people to take it seriously on the right, because what they're really trying to do, they've noticed this with the tax credit, is that it's always run to a cliff and then people freak out as if it's a massive crisis and what they're really trying to do is use the, the rest of the three and a half years of uh, the Trump presidency to uh, drive the industry into a place where it does not need uh, subsidies in 29. So it's really politically off the table for the next administration. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's kind of like an addict weaning off. But essentially, we, we've got to we've got to wean off this 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 addiction or this dependency on artificial government stimulus. Now, there are some out there, James, that, that would say that, you know, any subsidy for the solar industry is just a gift to the Chinese Communist Party, and that ultimately Mm -hmm. a lot of this money ends up flowing to Chinese manufacturers. What what would you say to that? Yeah, look, um, I I think uh, the the actual money in a solar install, even if you could buy everything straight from China, and frankly, you cannot buy panels from China, all right, in the US, you have to buy them from third party companies that might have some Chinese national participation. Um, But less than, when I do my math, less than 10% to 15% of our installers' money is actually going to, is actually paid uh, to, to a Chinese vendor of any source. And the system itself generates about four times its value over its life. So if we say, let's just say 15% versus 400%, we are talking about 40 times the money that China makes some marginal profit on, we're making in the reform of American energy. So that is a deal that America wins and China sells some marginal things. Do we want to move manufacturing over here? Yes. And we will continue to do that with tariffs and 45X, which is something my companies are already responding to. But uh, I think I think it just to put it to put the question the way you just did, um, I think that people who put it that way uh, are, are missing the point very much like um, the fact that the oil field has been using Chinese tubular goods to drill for American oil for decades. 
So, I mean, what I mean, do, do we want American energy or not? It's the it, these are where the tools are right now. We're already moving the manufacturing for that over. And as long as demand stays healthy in the U.S., manufacturers in the U.S. will be incentivized to invest. So if we see installers move their business model to highly competitive volume going up, tariffs remain in place, 45 X in a watered down version is still there. I mean, I can do math and I'm in the manufacturing business. I'll be all over American manufacturing five years from now in that kind of environment. If we see a demand side crash, then we're not going to have enough demand in the U S to justify a manufacturing investment. And I think that that's, Deeper investments in manufacturing, whether it's battery cell manufacturing, uh, critical minerals manufacturing, deeper components, Joe. Uh, frankly, I think that the the worst thing that we can do right now is hit the demand side while manufacturers are trying to ramp up. I can say that as a manufacturer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All right, James. So let's go. Let's go back to the 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 Twitter post here, or the X post. So the post is is titled or it's headlined "Subsidy Free by 2028." In the current battle over energy subsidies, the best lobbyists, not ideas, are winning, e.g. industrial mm -hmm. solar's subsidies get extended post-Trump while residentials end immediately. And here is a fair and effective way to end our addiction to subsidies. I'm not going to read the entire uh, uh, X post here, but what I'll do is I'll make sure we, we have a, an image of that that we can share and overlay in the final edit of this video. Uh, but James, for, for those that are watching out there, particularly those that are, are, are running or executives of solar industry companies, manufacturers, sales reps, contractors, what is it, what, what is your call to action for those individuals? Because I know you've been reaching out to a number of other solar CEOs today. Yeah. Uh, what is it that you would like these individuals to do? Okay. So first of all, if people tell you that you've got to settle for 25D ending this year, just know that that's because they rejected an offer that hurt corporate interests too much. So know who you're talking to in the solar business and understand that at a minimum, the residential business should get the 25D through the end of 28 if people are honestly representing residential installers. If you have an X or a Twitter account, get on X, follow the link that we're going to share with this video and repost, tag Alex and let him know that your solar company can keep their jobs and work within this transition time. It's not everything that everybody wants, but it's more than enough time for us to get sharp pencils out and get our industry off subsidies this time. So get out there and publicly uh, support this, uh, repost, tag, um, and let the people you know that are working with lobbying right now know that you know that they have an opportunity to save 25D. And if they don't save it, that's betrayal. James, who are the champions of this alternate proposal here? The champions of the alternate proposal? Um, Chip Roy came out this morning posting it. He's the guy that got in front of the House and said that he would stop the bill if it didn't have enough cuts to the Green New Deal, and actually did in the first round. Mike Lee, who's in the Senate right now, insisting on full IRA repeal, said this was an acceptable compromise this morning. The hardest core people on the right are willing to work with this industry and willing to work with, with these, uh, these uh, long-tail uh, residential and, 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 and some, some short tail solar installers, right? Anybody who wants just an even playing field for these credits and budget accountability, no loopholes and, uh, and, and sunset by the end of 28, they're willing to work with this. So we do, if we have a job fallout, it will only be because of poor lobbying from K street interests that just want to pad solar farms and stick it to residential people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know, James, one of the things you mentioned to me when we, we spoke last week or the, a couple of weeks ago was that, you know, a lot of times these corporate solar interests like to wrap themselves in, you know, sort of the, the mom and pop solar installer down the street. And in reality, the, the majority of these subsidies and benefits end up going to these large corporations. Um, what what happens if we don't take this proposal, James? Well, um, <laughs> I think if we don't get behind this, look, we've had this is not a first round. We've had three rounds of bill language getting through House Ways and Means, House Finance, Senate Finance. No one has stood up for the residential installer publicly. No one has actually been offering to put this wording into the text. This is the first time anyone has done it. And frankly, it's fiscal hawks on the right. If we don't take a real offer because we want other people to make an offer who have failed to make that effective in the last three rounds, then we deserve a cut. 
Like at the end of the day, this is how politics works. This is pragmatism. Uh, you know, I think that uh, with, without taking a political position, I, I am for any policy that makes energy freedom at homeowners. And I understand particularly homeowners have a tax disadvantage that these, that these credits address. So for my end, I'm in the more solar and batteries party, if you will. And I would also like it more cost effectively anyways. So more people do it. So if you're, if you're, you know, politically solar, which is the way I look at things, um, you know, as an innovator and as a, as a tech guy, um, then, uh, then, then we've got to get behind it. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, you know, betting on cloak and dagger games, uh, we've been seven months into that and, uh, we're, we're, we're three to zero, you know, we have, we have, we have zero and, uh, we had three rounds of, of people not, uh, defending residential installers. This is the most serious offer anywhere. So we, we've got to jump behind it, in my opinion. This is, this is the turning point, in my opinion, in the, in, in the bill negotiation. This is great. Well, James, definitely a major breakthrough from where we were just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, again, we're talking about an alternate proposal headlined solar subsidy free by 2028, and it has the support of several conservative uh, senators as well. So, uh, James, I know that you've got a bit of a time crunch and you need to get back to your meetings with senators there in Washington. Uh, I'm going to give you the last word here before we close out today's update. Well, I can't stress it enough. Um, read the X post, understand the world we're in. We're right now looking at 25D ending this year. This is a serious offer from some very competent people on the right to get us 25D through the end of 28. Save enough time for these mom and pop and uh, long tail businesses, if you're one of them, to succeed. Get on X, tell the members of Congress to, that are with you to, uh, to support this. Get on LinkedIn. We'll have posts. I know EG4 will have a post on there their site uh, on this and, and signature. We, we've come out as a company in support of this. Um, and, uh, and, 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 uh, tag, tag Alex as well. So he knows that this is getting solar support and, uh, he can actually leverage, uh, your small business, you know, jobs focused support to making sure that, uh, the larger solar farm interests don't get all the money here, which is what they've been doing for the last three rounds. So, uh, if you want to have an opinion two years from now, of what should have happened, get involved today and make it happen. All right, let's do it. And James, we'll make sure that we get that, that Twitter post up with the link where people can engage and make sure that their voice is heard on this issue as well. Uh, folks, this has been an update from James Showalter, CEO of EG4 Electronics. Uh, he's actively lobbying in Washington this week uh, to keep and uh, uh, preserve what we can of solar tax credits and subsidies, particularly as it would help to support the residential contractor and the residential side of the industry. Uh, James, as always, it's a pleasure having you on the program, and I thank you for spending some more time with our audience today. Thanks, Joe.